some things about this book uh, that I've written on settlement and local histories of the early Deccan. And uh, uh, I, I decided that because there is always a tendency of authors to uh, sort of, you know, just go on and on and on uh, on what they've written. So I've kind of divided this uh, conversation into three parts, maybe unequal parts. In the first part, I just very briefly talk about the why and the what of the book. Uh, and then I focus a bit on the crux of what I've done in this book and its interpretations. And, uh, and, and also maybe perhaps give, a, give those who are, who are not familiar with the Deccan something of an idea about how the different chapters and different sections of the book are laid out. Uh, and the third most important part I thought would be that I raise some questions and show some illustrations and then uh, this uh, should continue into the Q&A, and I mean, I think that that's when the real conversation will start. So, um, why? Uh, actually, uh, for most of us who are born and brought up in North India, there's very little that we know about South of the Vindhyas. So, uh, my teaching assignments at the University of Hyderabad uh, led uh, to several courses that I had to develop and teach. Uh, when I was in Hyderabad, and uh, then one drew upon the general books on South Indian history, which were available, textbooks, I mean. Uh, the Deccan was very partially or marginally or minimally discussed. Uh, and this was like very painful because the large majority of students in the early years of the inception of the university actually came from the region that I define as the Deccan, primarily Andhra Pradesh, uh, to some extent, Maharashtra and of course Karnataka and all, uh, and uh, it was um, it was it was really problematic as to how we would address issues about the immediately uh, surrounding history of where we were located. So in 1993, um, you know, working with students and having contributions by them also, I published a book called the the um, uh, Social and Economic History of the Deccan: Some Interpretations. It was a kind of a schematic collection of papers, but primarily the focus over here was on to move away from that entangled question that most of the political histories of the region were, were dealing with at that point in time, namely trying to find out the original homeland of the Shatavanas, the most important dynasty that ruled in these parts. And second, what was their chronology? A knotted problem, still continues to be a knotted problem. Uh, so therefore, I thought that let's focus away from events into understanding the larger processes of historical change. Uh, so that's where we were. Uh, and uh, I realized that, well, I did this book, but then in 2019, suddenly the publisher said, we need a reprint edition because there are no more copies. And to my surprise, I mean, there weren't any other texts uh, that could fill in the gap. So till even till now, uh, there is such a lack of uh, systematic accounts for the, so we get divided into the Ganga Valley civilization or the Indus or the Kaveri and so on and so forth. And therefore something in the middle gets missed out. Uh, it sort of, sort of acts like a bridge, but nobody realizes that the bridge also has to be stable, right? Otherwise, how can you cross it? Uh, and so therefore this notion of the stability of the region and what it really entails for the very, very early periods, the what we would call the foundations of culture and civilization in this part of the country, I thought uh, was a desertrum, particularly since living in Hyderabad, it uh, also uh, was something that I was, uh, you know, really, uh, I really enjoyed. And that was the very rich uh, medieval history uh, of the city as well as of the region. And this had been written about, this was discussed primarily because of the extinct monuments, the language, etc. But then uh, one needed to go back, and I was egged on to going back. Uh, and the second thing that struck me was this very old, uh, uh, well, very ancient landscape uh, that uh, after joining the Society to Save Rocks in Hyderabad, I learned it was 2,500. Uh, 2,500 2, million years old. Uh, and the secretary of the society uh, told me that, uh, you know, we are not just saving rocks. By the way, she, uh, she, gave me a, she gave me an article in which she 
uh, wrote, uh, and I quote over here, rocks sustain a very special ecosystem with flora and fauna, and once destroyed, they never grow back. So it's not just simply the unique landscape, but it's the kind of uh, ecosystem and it's the kind of life that revolved around this ecosystem over historical time uh, that needed to be addressed, right? So there were these two things on the one hand, a very rich, dynamic, uh, very well-woven, textured history of the medieval times and very well illustrated and documented. On the other hand, this very ancient uh, historical uh, uh, geological landscape and in between there was this uh, very important phase of uh, history uh, that we only got to know in bits and pieces. It, it's just a, a, a dynasty here, a dynasty there, the rise of many of these dynasties, their downfall uh, and the great urge after the formation of the linguistic states, the great urge of many of the linguistic states, uh, particularly uh, Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh at that time, before 2014, uh, everybody vying with each other to find uh, the pristine original uh, civilization growing in their particular bounded space. So it didn't matter whether dynasties were ruling across linguistic states, but for, for, for the purpose of that particular agenda, just as the history of the nation state, you're looking for origins, you're looking for uh, you're looking for purity, you're looking for something uh, very, uh, uh, very ancient so that the identity of the present day state can be uh, hinged upon. So uh, I thought that this, uh, we need to get, get away from some of these uh, entangled questions. They're never going to be solved unless we get a lot more uh, information on the subject. And um, uh, right away, I must mention to you that uh, unlike uh, the Ganges Valley or even the Tamil Akkam regions, uh, for the decade of the very, very early period, we don't have a corpus of literary text. We do have the Gatha Shatsati uh, and we do have uh, inscriptions, but uh, uh, a, an entire corpus of literary uh, texts is not available. And so therefore, what you're always doing with it, you're always doing is finding archaeological evidence, uh, some artifacts, some monuments, and then trying to uh, relate it not only to the inscriptions, but primarily, and this was kind of a problem, you're pr primarily uh, linking it up to uh, literary evidence that comes from regions north of the Vindyas. So their perceptions of the region become the historical platform on which we must build. This also I found a little problematic and I'll talk about that. Now, uh, uh, in a sentence, if I have to, place before you. Uh, this is a obviously not a, a dynastic history of the Deccan. Uh, it is also uh, not a descriptive book in the sense that it does not describe each and every aspect of Deccan's history. Rather, it is a, a description of settlements and their interconnectedness and placing these settlements within the larger forces of historical change that are not confined only to the Deccan, but the way in which <clears throat> the Deccan emerges in this, in, in this scenario. Now, <clears throat> what this writing this book enabled me to do is the following. And this is an endeavor I think most historians uh, amongst uh, all of us who are here uh, endeavor to do. One was that uh, one needed to get away from labeling the Hindu India and the Muslim India and I wondered very conveniently, we forget Buddhist India. The Deccan of the period I'm discussing is full of Buddhist monuments, but we never use Buddhist Deccan. Then the question of periodization, this was also problematic in ancient India, medieval India, but these don't get uh, identically uh, sort of uh, fixtured on regional histories. And uh, why would regional histories only be treated in larger texts, North Indian textual, uh, traditions or South Indian, as when a particular dynasty becomes a so-called empire, the Shatamahanas, the Chalukyas, or the Rashtrakutas, and so on and so forth. So there is this, <clears throat> there is a kind of rejection of the large uh, framework of the Deccan a a as an identity, and only it, uh, like a little hill coming up whenever there is a political dynasty. 
And most importantly, in the books that a literature survey that I did, which I'll mention a bit just now, is that all the time the political history is prominent and everything else, social history, economic history, cultural history, history of art, all that is put into compartments. So we may have great writings on Ajanta art, or we have great writings on uh, you know, religious traditions and so on and so forth, but these are not integrated into the larger narrative. So uh, I asked a question, simple question. In fact, we asked, I asked several questions. Uh, what were the type of historical changes that were replicated in the decade from wherever, right? In contact with the North or the South, what was replicated? What was absent from these uh, traditions? And finally, even if they were present, even if like, for example, the Brahmi script and so on and so forth, even if it was presented, in what form did it emerge? And where did it emerge? Was it uniformly found everywhere, uh, all over, or were the niche areas where this was found? So these are some of the questions. And as I said, <clears throat> in the preliminaries, everybody asked me why the history of the Deccan? Why don't we consider history of South India? I mean, uh, the Deccan is an integral part of South India. So, I mean, there's no real, peninsula India as a whole can be treated. So something that really, struck my mind was that when I did the literature survey it was way back in the 19th century, uh, in 1885, I do believe, and again then uh, in 1892, one of the first histories that we have south of the Vindyas is the history of the Deccan by R.G. Vandarkar. And it's not a history of South India, it's primarily a history of that portion of the Deccan, which is today called Maharashtra. But the, um, but the disturbing point about this book Obviously, it was written in the latter of the 19th century, was that it used a lot of Puranic and Vedic and other literature to define uh, what is the Deccan. And sadly, I should say, <laughs> the inhabitants of the Deccan were called Dasyus. So this is what the early uh, texts refer to, the Aitreya Brahmana and so on and so forth, referred to as people living beyond the borders. Uh, there's a very famous reference in the Aitreya Brahmana that uh, the sage Vishwamitra cursed his son to go and inhabit regions south of the, uh, well, uh, borders, on the borders. And who were these cursed sons? They were the Mutibas, the Shabaras, the Andras, etc. And all these people were supposed to be called Dasyus in that verse. And it's surprising that the impact of Bandarkar's work on even the textbooks that came up uh, in the, uh, the Telugu Academy brought out textbooks uh, under the composite state of Andhra Pradesh. And even they began their histories with this lack or this negative image of what the region was. Uh, then uh, uh, the next important, uh, uh, what you call it, publication was by the great uh, Gulam Yazdani, the first director of the, uh, director general, uh, director of the Department of Archaeology under His Highness the Nizam Srimanyas. And he located taken to be the, the political territoriality of the Nizam's dominion. And he, and he, of course, we can't dismiss all the work that he did. He did fantastic work in documenting the Ajanta frescoes. He excavated at Kondapur. He did the Bidar work. And therefore, a database was like generated under his directorship. But the uh, sad thing was that he edited this volume and he divided the chapters dynasty-wise. So one dynasty, somebody wrote about one dynasty, somebody wrote about. There was a fantastic chapter on the historical geography of the Deccan by H.C. Uh, Ray Chaudhary, that is still a, a classic. And then, of course, uh, he had his own piece on art and culture and so on. But, you know, this, this tendency to simply uh, uh, have the framework of dynastic history because political elites needed to have a sense of what they were ruling, right? So uh, that tendency uh, continued. Uh, and finally, of course, I would suggest, uh, in, uh, in, uh, before we proceed to what I did, I would suggest that there were three ways in which the history of the Deccan became subsumed. One was uh, that a lot of people thought it was okay to subsume it under the entity of South India and the classic work of Nilakanta Shastri from prehistoric times uh, up to the fall of Vijayanagar is an example. Uh, he followed the same pattern of uh, what, uh, what Bhandarkar had done, except that uh, he only uh, wrote about the Deccan when there was a particular dynasty there. And another thing that he brought in, and this is, uh, this is again problematic, uh, is that he brought in the whole issue of Aryanization, uh, the concept of Aryanization. So 
who are the agents of Aryanization? Uh, I mean, I, I sort of, I, I, I refute that in the sense that if at all we have to talk about influences coming from north of the Vindhyas, then it is surely not Aryan influences, but influences coming through the Buddhist and Jain monks and so on. Uh, historically, that has been documented. Uh, and then the second way, and by the way, Oxford University Press has only recently brought out uh, another concise history of South India, where of course, by Nobuo Karashima, some of you may know him, the Japanese scholar. And uh, in this book, it's a concise history of South India up to colonial times. The very word concise indicates that Every segment has a very limited amount of information, but one must give credit to Karashrama that he did move north of the river Penar and, and gave some visibility to the kind of society that uh, was inhabited uh, in what we call the Deccan regions. The second way, of course, is I've already mentioned that linguistic states, the individual, there was a plethora, proliferation of histories of Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Goa, and so on and so forth. So I won't go into too many details about that, but uh, let me tell you one thing, which is very striking, that before history, before questions of identity and history come into being, prehistoric and protohistoric studies especially led by the Deccan College Pune, continue and very freely use the terminology Deccan to define the distribution pattern of the way in which uh, uh, these uh, cultures spread out, the material culture, so to speak, the topography, the spread of these cultures from Stone Age times to the Neolithic times and so on. And Alchin, uh, who was a very well-known archaeologist way back in 1993, had a very interesting title, Neolithic Cattle Keepers of South India, the Ash Mounds of the Deccan. Obviously, this indicates that there is something peculiar about the Deccan in the ash mounds that uh, are available to us only in some areas, uh, not, uh, not in the far south, but primarily in the Deccan zones. Of course, there's a long history about what these ash mounds are. And just last year, Professor Paddaya from Deccan, the former uh, professor, formerly of the Deccan College, uh, he brought out another book on the ash mounds of the Deccan, and he made some very interesting observations, which I thought I could also share with you. And he says that the nature of the agro-pastoral villages that we have in the Deccan have a kind of, a uh, have a kind of uh, let's say, uh, tenacity of survival. Uh, and he writes, if I can find the quote, yes, he writes, but I quote, the larger political and socio-religious conditions may have undergone dramatic changes across time, but these had little or no effect on the basic structure of village-based agro-pastoral life, which had its genesis in Neolithic uh, period and, and were tied uh, tightly to the region's resource base. Uh, we can disagree with uh, some parts of this quotation, but the important point that is being emphasized is on the particularity of the resource base and the terrain that gave rise to us. Uh, it's not just a coincidence that uh, ICRISAT, uh, the, uh, the, the organization that looks after cropping in the semi-arid tropics is located not far from Hyderabad, and they are also dealing with the way in which particular landscapes gives rise to particular kinds of millets and other crops, and we are using the experiments here to apply them to Africa. Now, this is just the introduction, a few preliminary statements, and I haven't done justice to historiography and stuff like that, but we can always talk about this. Now, what is this book of mine? What's the crux of this book? It's not a place name studies, because people will get an image that settlements and local histories must be place name studies. This time studies was very popular in the early half of the 20th century. And this was basically part of the history. Cunningham started the historical geography of the subcontinent. Many people took up this and they, they used mainly inscriptions, literature. Uh, there was very little archeology span that was used to do these place name studies. But anyway, I have not done a place name study. This is not a book about place name studies. Secondly, the big problem that I had is that unlike North India, unlike the Buddhist literature that talks about Janapadas and Mahajanapadas for the early period, we don't have, as I said, the literary text. We have to depend maybe on Buddhist literature or maybe uh, as I follow in this regard, I follow B.D. Chattopadhyay, who uh, talked about Janapada-like entities. And he, uh, he defined these entities being based on coins that were with legends and names of kings much before the rise of the Shatwahanas, and he identified certain localities. 
And uh, I, I draw upon that, I draw upon that idea of Janapada-like uh, like entities or localities. And I do emphasize on these points because as is well known for scholars who are working on South India, um, Andhra Pradesh government was, uh, before 2014, was very active in its archaeological excavations, and so also was Maharashtra under the ages of the Deccan College. It was not, it was a bit iffy iffy for other regions of South India, but uh, archaeology still uh, has not given us systematic, uh, you know, uh, zonal data, so to speak. So one is still, you know, having issues about how to use archaeological data, but nonetheless, uh, the coins became a very significant way as markers of identifying these localities. So in the main, my argument, I'll just give that to you right away. In the main, my argument is as follows, that these settlements that I will show you maps about just now, they are in a continual state of negotiating with each other. In other words, uh, these settlements highlight the way social groups, and how do I get to know about the social groups? The artifacts that they produce, the small objects that they produce, the monuments that they produce, and how they establish networks between them. Uh, so for example, you have iron, uh, iron producing or iron uh, smelting areas, uh, bean producing areas, lots of small, small, small images of the Buddha uh, located in some settlement. What were they doing? What were all these beads in one settlement? Or what were all these iron art in one settlement doing? No, obviously not for the consumption of the locality only, but of course, uh, uh, exchanged, uh, small scale exchange happening across these regions. And most significantly, of course, uh, the whole question of monastic habitations. I'll show you a map just now, uh, where they interacted with merchants and traders. So it's not just simply this small scale craft production, there are also traders and traders. So where did they get their surplus from? What were they doing? Where were they carrying from? And we get to know about these merchants and traders in a lot of inscriptional material, both in the Western Deccan as well as in the Eastern Deccan, where names of people giving these, uh, uh, you know, carrying with them objects or donating these objects to the Sangha, etc. Et so one has, uh, you know, mapped these out when they tried to understand what were the localities they were coming from and so on and so forth. And finally, what is fascinating for me is, and this is not only me, there are scholars like Akira Shimada, uh, whose book on Amra, uh, re-looking at Amravati. Uh, there are many other scholars who are looking at the artist, uh, the history of art and so on. Uh, everybody is now seriously looking at the fact that how do you locate everything to be attributed to the great Shatohana dynasty or the Ichwaku dynasty. There are many, many, many chiefs, heads of Goshtis as they are called, heads of Negamas, all these people were, uh, were, were quite uh, wealthy, endowed with wealth. They also had a lot of local uh, power uh, that made them issue coins with their names on them. Uh, and these people then lived uh, in their own localities, but uh, they exchanged with localities in their proximity. So the evidence is complex. Obviously, uh, for this early period, since we don't have a corpus of literary text, we have to make some sense of the inscriptions, the artifacts, the coins and all. And uh, somehow the other, when I was doing, I was reading Donna Haraway's Neural Networks. And I thought that if we make people central to these networks, then we'll get some idea about why and how these settlements became what they were. So it's not just the static, archaeological data there or the uh, inscribed word over there, but it's like trying to look at the interconnectedness uh, between these uh, uh, between these books. Sorry about this uh, phone call. Uh, and uh, now, so, so uh, uh, maybe uh, what I should uh, do now is, uh, um, he's come. Uh, what I should do now is maybe uh, take you to uh, take you to the uh, uh, structure of the book and also maybe uh, share my screen and show you uh, the settlements that I have mapped and also some that I have uh, borrowed from work of others. Uh, so uh, what is the, uh, the uh, uh, before I go there, I said that I, I don't think that Aryanization as a viable model is a thing because all these uh, interconnectedness, et cetera, et cetera, that I was talking about, uh, there, there is, there is uh, 
uh, one can see a significant role of Buddhist monks and also Jain monks traveling through the Deccan uh, to the Tamil areas uh, and, the, and the Buddhist monks traveling into Sri Lanka and so on and so forth. So if it all influences came, they came through these monks. And uh, what is the evidence for that? Uh, you know, you don't find uh, Northern black polished ware pottery uh, as endemic to the Deccan. The Deccan is known for its black and red ware or, the, or just the red ware pottery. Now, Northern black polished ware is particular to northeastern India, that is Bihar, eastern Uttar Pradesh and all. You find remnants of this both in the western Deccan as well as in the eastern Deccan. And last but not least, the Brahmi script, because Ashokan inscriptions are found in the Eastern Deccan, the Southern Deccan, and the Western Deccan. There's a, there's a kind of a serious absence in what we call the Central Deccan, but uh, I was told the other day on a WhatsApp message by Srinivasan, I don't know whether he's there, that they are doing some village to village surveys in Medak district, and he says that they have found a Brahmi inscription of the third century BC, uh, which says Deva Nam, and it is a prefixes uh, Nandipada. Uh, that's a symbol, and then he thinks that this Deva Nam is probably Deva Nam Priyadashi. But we have to wait for the rest of the excavation of this 90 hectares mound, which they have found, I think, in Kulcha, Kulcharam uh, village of Medak district. So, anyway, that's uh, for the future. So, the structure of the book then is as follows I've divided it into three parts. Uh, the first part is called Establishing the Terrain, the second part is called Standing on the Particular. And third is called accessing the other. And uh, uh, for the first part in establishing the terrain, uh, I raise some, it's not just simply the physical geography of the Deccan, but I'm going back to looking at the evolution of the word Deccan itself. Because Deccan is an anglicized word of some of us who are in Hyderabad know is Dakkan. Dakkan, the Persian word that is used to describe the uh, Dakkan sultanates and all that. But much before that, uh, the Buddhist texts refer to what is called Dakhina Path, Dakhina, K K H I N A, Dakhina Path, Avanti Dakhina Path, where they uh, emphasize that the soil is very hard in these uh, areas, and the monks can wear footwear to travel through this Avanti Dakhina Path. Of course, some other scholars look at Dakshina Path, which is referred to in the Arthashastra and all, but Dakshina Path also sus subsumes uh, the far south. Uh, but the Dakshina Path uh, and Dakshina Path, both these terms, uh, the, the word Dakshina Path fa is found, of course, in the uh, Shatohana inscriptions, the famous uh, Na uh, Nanighat inscription of Queen Nagenika. Where she refers to her husband, Gautami Putra Shatkarni, as Dakshina Path Pati, that is the lord of Dakshina Path. And uh, the Nasik inscription of Queen Balashri, again, a Shatohana queen, she, uh, in that inscription, we have the components of the Deccan, which I read, Asaka, Asika, Muluka, Suratha, Kukura, Apranta, Anupa, Vidharva, Akara, and Avanti. So, sort of Janapada-like entities, which Bidi, that what I was talking about, uh, but these entities are all north of the river Pennar and not south of it. Uh, we can we can literally take them as entities that stayed on, but I argue uh, in the spatial uh, in the spatial descriptions that I uh, give in the book that uh, boundaries were always flexible; they were always changing. But there is an essence of identifying some entities, uh, and this we get to know mainly because of the coins and the legends on coins and so on and so forth. That so, let me uh, just pause over here and share my screen and show you a couple of maps on the different, of course, it will also define what I understand by the Deccan. It defines to you some of the settlements that I've detailed, uh, discussed in the book. And uh, it also tells you about types of settlement, okay? So now sharing the screen with all of you. Uh, Can you can you see the screen? 
Yeah. Okay. Is it visible? Yeah, yeah yes. you can see the screen. Okay, okay, good, good, good. So uh, in delineating the area of study, I uh, uh, took broad geographical features south of the Vindhyas, uh, demarcating uh, the river Narmada in the north and the river Penar in the south and divided it. In, uh, huh? Sorry, there seems to be some problem because what we are seeing is just slideshow and resume slideshow. Professor? So you just have to okay. Yeah. 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 Is that okay? Yeah. Yes, yes. Now it is fine, madam. Okay, okay. There's some message came there. Sorry, sorry about that. So this was the area of study with the River Narmada in the south, the Pennar in the south, the Mysore Plateau being uh, uh, an important demarcating thing in the south. And then I divided it into four sub-regions, uh, the Western Deccan as A, uh, the Central Deccan, as B and the Eastern Deccan as C and the Southern Deccan as D. And this sort of blurred the political boundaries that you know, usually scholars use, also blurred the modern day linguistic boundaries. And we looked at entities that were, like for example, in B, the core areas of habitation and all were around the mid Godavari Valley. Then in the Eastern uh, uh, areas, there were uh, the lower Krishna Valley, and you had the Western Ghats and so on and so forth, which, were, which had a lot of historical evidence. And of course, uh, as, as everybody knows, in the Southern Deccan, uh, you have the famous uh, collection of uh, the earliest uh, inscriptions we have for the region, namely Ashokan inscription. Now, how do we, how do we proceed to the next? Yeah, okay. So uh, one of the things I have done uh, as one of the, the immediate chapter after I discussed the terrain is to look at uh, uh, focused studies on uh, key uh, sub-regions. So where, there we have the sites around the mid Godavari Valley and the sites south in the lower Krishna Valley, but that doesn't mean that in other chapters I've not looked at these other settlements. All these settlements that have been think, are either having a substantial amount of inscriptions or have been excavated either by the Deccan College or by the State Department of Archaeology and Museums, Government of Andhra Pradesh, or by the State Department of Archaeology, Government of Karnataka, and so on and so forth, right? So I'm putting these in the context of the far south because the number of, uh, the other day, Professor Subrayalu and we have been discussing this, the archaeological sites in the far south, only recently people have started looking at them in a, uh, primarily because they have the Shangam text, so therefore there's no need to focus too much on, on the archaeological uh, uh, aspects. And then, of course, <clears throat> uh, uh, there is a, a concentration, there's a very deep concentration of sites in the lower Krishna basin and a very famous settlements. And I think there is a kind of historiographical history. People have been uh, documenting this part of the country uh, for, for a longer period, and so therefore there is this uh, concentration. But uh, it's not true only of the lower Krishna Valley. Uh, that it's also true of, uh, and here you can see, you can see, of course, this is a map of the uh, government of Andhra Pradesh, uh, sorry, the state of Andhra Pradesh, because the, I've taken this from Wikipedia Commons, and scholar who has done this has done this before 2012. So he's mapped all the Buddhist settlements in terms of the rock cut monasteries, the Lato monasteries, the stupas, the rock edicts, uh, and, and placed them the way they were. And all the sites that I discuss are located in this map. And you see that it's only on the uh, southwestern corner that you have three places where you have rock edicts. And of course, if you extend the map into uh, Karnataka and, and, and Maharashtra, then of course you also have many more Shokan edicts. And all these, by the way, are minor rock edicts, except for one at Yaragudi, which is a major uh, rock edict of Ashoka. And finally, uh, acknowledgements to uh, Himakshu Prabha Ray, uh, there is a systematic documentation that has already been done of the port towns, the settlements, and the cave settlements, uh, and, the, uh, uh, and the Buddhist uh, monasteries uh, in the Western Deccan. So the Western Deccan and the Eastern Deccan have had a large concentration of work that has been done, uh, whereas uh, in, these, um, in, this, um, uh, in the Central and the Southern Deccan, we have only marginal uh, studies. See, take a look at this map. The Mid-Godavari Valley is absent, absent, zero. 
I mean, as though nothing existed. And uh, subsequently, of course, when documentation did begin to happen, we find that some of these mid Godavari settlements were very unique. They are the ones that produced the earliest coins with legends, names of kings, and so on and so forth. They also were uh, iron-generating uh, sites. Uh, and there is a density of population uh, over here, which is not mapped at all in this 19, this is a 1986 uh, map. So I'll stop uh, the share over here and then we'll come back to illustrations later. So now, what do we do with these subregions? So what I did was I took up local histories of these uh, zonal areas. And the first uh, zonal area, as I said, that I took up was the local polities of, I compared, I compared the local polities uh, or state formation, if you want to call it, state formation in the mid Godavari Valley with the lower Krishna Valley. Uh, this, is, this is important. Uh, of course, I did this much before the formation of the state of Telangana in 2014. But of course, it sort of now rings a bell that there were certain peculiar features of the way in which the processes of state formation took place uh, in different zones. Uh, and uh, there were similarities as well. So one of the major similarities, as I've been saying uh, throughout, uh, is the evidence of coins. Uh, and so you have a concentrated particular type of coinage of kings that are called Gopa kings in the mid Godavari Valley. They are pre Shatavahana. And in the lower Krishna Valley, you have coins of what are called Sada kings found at Vadamanu in particular, but generally spread out. There is also an inscription uh, of, of the Sadas and all. And these are also pre Shatohana. So what is, what is happening over here is that the transition from what we call in archeological terms, the megalithic phase of habitation, that is the iron, early iron using cultures of the Deccan and the South, and their transition into the early historic period is not marked only by the Mauryan presence, but rather it is a processes of internal change that are also happening, which are evident to us through these local polities becoming powerful, right? So uh, to make this complicated story very simple, what I did was I looked at uh, uh, the theory of professional co-people, which Irvin Rouse had used, uh, which argued that, I quote, the professional and sustaining co-people share civilization. They may be both urban, both rural, or one may be urban and one rural. And drawing on this, I argued that these sustaining poor people engage with each other to produce lo local polities. Now, these local polities are not just simply coins. At a place called Kotalingala, Dhuli Katha, Petabankur in the mid Godavari Valley, you have fortifications, you have granaries, you have wells, uh, very well constructed wells which continue to be used even now. Uh, and you have a whole lot of artifacts, you have furnaces, you have all kinds of materials. And if you look at the lower Krishna Valley, you, you don't have iron tools and so on and so forth. You have the coins, you have inscribed names, a famous Bhatti Prolo inscription you have from there, you have Guntepali, you have early Amravati, you have Vadamanu, all these show, so, show a similar transition. And it is in these qualities, it's in the context of these qualities that the external influences of the Mauryas begin to take place. So there is some kind of a stop. So, so, so if, if the mid Godavari people are the co-sustaining, the uh, professional co-sustaining people, in the coastal areas, I use Patricia uh, Springbok, who says that these societies are more transactional. Uh, pa is created by interactions, exchanges, and those structures of social life that provide a multiplicity of forums for negotiation, transaction and exchange. So these are not static societies in some antiquity, just lying there as uh, imbecile entities, but very dynamic and very interactive. Uh, uh, then I move on to uh, spreading this discussion into other subregions, and I, uh, I have a section in the first part on urban centers. And over here I raise fundamental questions about why we should not use labels for even uh, regional history, uh, Andhra, Shatohana, Buddhist, Roman. I mean, these are not very suitable labels that enable you to really come to know about what exactly a, set a particular settlement is. There may be a Roman coin that doesn't make it a Roman settlement. 
Uh, there may be a even there may be even wine jars found in excavations. Still doesn't make you Roman color. Just because there are remnants of one or two, uh, um, you know, sculptures from the uh, 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 indicating Buddhism doesn't make it a Buddhist site. So these labels I question in that uh, third chapter, and I then go move on to uh, questioning the theories of urbanization, the impositions that have been done. For the Deccan, that is, you have the famous theories of urbanization for North India, uh, where they try to explain spread of iron technology, spread of agrarian surplus, rise of urban centers, and so on and so forth. And you have scholars like Clarence Maloney and others saying, and I quote, there is no evidence of early civilization between the gold bearing zones of Karnataka and Madurai. Likewise, the track between the Godavari and the Kaveri has little to offer as far as civilization is concerned. All this is really problematic because they're using theoretical models uh, of uh, river valley civilizations. The nature of agrarian production there, a dominant agrarian mode of production, doesn't apply to regions south of the Vindhya. This is mixed farming country, agro-pastoral country. So therefore, you have a lot of iron technology. But this does not uh, lead to the emergence of urban centers the way we have urban centers in other, uh, in, in other belts or in other uh, and in fact, H. Uh, Sarkar, a very famous archaeologist, 1986, he gave the presidential address to the Andhra Pradesh History Congress in 1986 at Guntur, and he said that, you know, all these years we have been documenting and talking about Buddhist monuments, the great monumentality of the stupas, the chaityas, etc., but he never bothered about the hinterland. What supported these monumental constructions? Who were the people? Who were the consumers? How did they produce uh, the wealth to be able to, did all this wealth come from outside? Was it not generated by communities that were living in and around these monuments? Uh, so also the Buddhist cave temples of Western India, were these the monks and uh, were these the traders and merchants only who came and excavated the cave? What about the hinterland of Nashik and Nanegat and Bedza and, and Junar and so on and so forth? What was the relationship between the, uh, now a lot of work has gone on, Scholars like Lars Pogan, Gregory Chopin, and all these people are trying to look at the relationship between the monks and the community uh, at large. And this is something that I discuss in the second part of the book. And the first essay, which some of you may have read, and it is a republication from a, a, a Brill book that uh, was published in 2014 on Kondapur. And uh, Kondapur gives us this fascinating history, which uh, Yazdani who excavated there called it a Buddhist center. In 2009-11, when it was excavated again by Maheshwari, she said, no, 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 this is not a Buddhist settlement. This is actually, uh, uh, there are Vedic altars and there are shrines, uh, there, are, uh, there are Hindu shrines over there. And therefore, I raise a fundamental question, how can archaeology be interpreted? Uh, I'll show you some uh, illustrations of Kondapur. What these scholars totally forget in labeling is that it was such a cosmopolitan center. It produced about 50,000 or more beads. An entire book was written on the beads of Kondapur. What were these thousands and thousands of beads doing at the particular settlement? Or that there was so much of Roman uh, coinage of coins of Tiberius and of Augustus lying over here, terracottas of a fantastic kind. Uh, there were shrines of non-Buddhist, non-Brahmanical, whatever you want to call them, Lajja Gauris and others. So it was truly a cosmopolitan center where people traveled through. It's in the heart of the Deccan, you know, just 40 kilometers away from Hyderabad. So maybe people traveling from the Eastern Deccan into the Western Deccan, took them a long time to travel, would, would have a sojourn at Kondapur. So I'm looking at how archeology span uh, is not just a presentation of mere facts. Uh, I mean, they're, they're not just available over there. I think that it, they need interpretation and they need a questioning. Uh, automatically, you, you cannot just use an archeological material or piece of information and, 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 and describe a settlement. So it's very simple. Uh, it seems very simple for scholars, but it's not so simple. Talking about beads, Taxila, which is a famous site, and Nagarjun Konda, which is even more famous, only had 700 or 500 beads. Uh, things. So, I mean, you know, if you compare the quantum of beads that were found over here, it obviously indicates that it was a very huge settlement with a lot of people working on this uh, industry. Uh, and then I move on and standing on the particular, I move on to looking at a particular, a particular Buddhist viharas 
one in Totulakonda near Vishakapatnam, and the other in Telangana that is near Nalgonda called uh, Fanigiri. Those of you who live in Hyderabad must go to Fanigiri. Those who live in Andhra Pradesh must go to Totulakonda and Babikonda. And these are fascinating hill settlements of Biharas. And what I discuss over here is the water management systems of water and how water was collected for the use of monks. But that's not all. Uh, following the work of Lars Spogan in particular, because he worked on Totlokonda and Babikonda, the relationship that these viharas had with the village settlements at the base of the hill. What he's argued is that the rituals that were followed at the base of the hill impacted the way the monks were living and how they were interacting with the community. Similarly, if you look at Fanigiri, it is surrounded by other hills where you have Vardhaman, Kota, Trimulgiri, and others. And there are lots and lots of uh, fields, agricultural fields around, the, around these hills. So the Buddhist monks began to develop a very close relationship with the agrarian hinterlands in the midst of which they were living. And the monks were thus not just simply uh, people living in solitude, there's fantastic sculpture, classical sculpture from Fanigiri. There is also fantastic uh, uh, coinage, terracottas, inscriptions uh, that are found. What were coins doing at these Bihara and uh, Buddhist settlements? So that's the particular uh, second chapter of standing on the particular. The third is like I'm moving into the early medieval now from the ancient, from the prehistoric ancient to the early medieval. And I'll take a look at the particularity of a place called Patancheru. Some of you may know it again, the Hyderabadis word Patancheru. Uh, and here, uh, it's very interesting. It's a market town, but all the evidence that is extant, that is remaining, uh, the inscriptions tell us about the Chalukyan, Balami Chalukya, Skalaya, all the dynasties that apparently had their origins in Karnataka, but they were all in close proximity with a place called Potolakere, uh, that is Patancheru. And they inhabited this whole area and have left behind fantastic sculptural evidence. Uh, and they have also left behind uh, documentation of the gems that were very, very powerful. They are supposed, according to literary uh, references, Kannada literary references, there were about 800 Jain Basadis in this area. And uh, some remnants of the Jain cultural evidence is also there. And the interesting thing about Patancheru is that there is a continuity of settlements right down to the present times. So it has been very difficult to excavate over here, except the 1973 excavation that was done within the Ikrisat campus that revealed a big, huge sun temple over there. And then I move on to an interesting section and the last section of the book, which is called Accessing the Other. And I and here, uh, you see, I had told you about the problems that I have with periodization. I mean, here I'm looking at, uh, uh, I've entitled it Conversations at Nagarjun Konda, but I'm using contemporary uh, Mulkaraj Anand's writings on uh, what Nagarjuna Konda must have been in the early historic times because, why did he do this? Because Nehru was very keen on setting up the temples of modern India and salvage archeology span had to be done uh, around Nagarjun Konda. And so therefore everything was quickly, uh, you know, sort of taken up to the hillside, a museum was set up. So everything you see in Nagarjun Konda now is an uprooted, uh, uprooted material. But what, uh, what Mulkraj Anand did was, he talked about these conversations where he talked about people coming from different parts, from Gandhara, from, Tamba, from Sri Lanka, the Andras, the Shilpins, the Chenchus, and various social groups conversing with each other in this, in this, in this uh, fictitious, it's a fictitious story. So what I did was I looked at this fictitious story and then I went into the inscriptions and into the objects that are available at Nagarjun Konda and the sculpture and I tried to uh, you know, uh, I, I try to uh, uh, you know look at look at the proximity of these cultural, this cultural and uh, inscriptional evidence to see whether indeed this was a place where people met, where, where accessing the other was important. The Roman material, in fact, uh, it it was an important center for the Chinese who came to take all those Buddhist texts. Some of those Buddhist texts are now available to us only in Chinese translations. 
Uh, and then I move on to uh, another uh, early medieval uh, settlement that is Shramana Belgola, uh, moving into Karnataka, uh, uh, where where you have uh, where I have a discussion on inscriptions of the Jains uh, and the way in which renunciation and pilgrimage. I juxtapose the two because all these faiths, whether it's the Buddhists or the Jains, they were undergoing a transformation in their location here uh, in the desert. And so there's a lot of discussion on how one should not have ownership of things, no rituals should be there, etc. But tendencies are to the opposite. In fact, the Deccan has yielded the um, very unique evidence in Anandpur of the Yapinyas. Yapinyas are very, un, uh, well, uh, well, not unknown, uh, they were very well known at that point in time because they were the gurus of the Gangas. They were a particular sect of very radical sect of Jains, very different from the Chwetambaras, certainly had some similarities with the Digambaras who were naked, uh, uh, the naked, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, Jain uh, monks. So I uh, take a look at this. It's a famous site. Why? The great Mauryan king but the, and Badrabadu, when there was a famine in the north, they all migrated to Shravana Velgola. Why Shravana Velgola? And of course, there is this colossal uh, Gomateshwara statue also over there. So I take a look at the relationship between the inscriptional evidence and the debates that went on within the Jain uh, uh, intellectuals or Jain monks on whether renunciation was an ideal or pilgrimage was. And finally, again, taking a risk because uh, this is something that I think is very relevant to my, the larger argument in my book. I move on to, uh, to oral history because the uh, study that is the last study of accessing the other is this place called Nanakram Gura, which is just uh, at the at the back of our university, uh, which is from a village in, uh, in the last 10 years or 15 years, from a, being a small village, it has become a, a megapolis. It's an SEZ, -Z, and uh, so in the oral history project, we looked at uh, all these relationships, the relationship between pastoralism, agriculture, the use of water resources, and the way in which these communities remember their past, I learned a lot. The past is not an alien land for them. It's very much their present. Uh, it sort of harks back to what Carr tells us: all history is contemporary history. They don't look at they don't look at history as something, uh, you know, an alien back. I mean, like Serto says, uh, you know, some deep down, you know, something that has happened. It's very much their lives. And in accessing the other, the interesting facet of this settlement was that more than 50% of the population were Lodha Khatris from Uttar Pradesh. And the rest of them were Malas, Madigas, uh, Kumaras, uh, Chakkalis, uh, and so on and so forth. So it was a very interesting case study, which also had a 400-year, 500-year-old temple. that is, of course, in disuse, but it has been renovated at innumerable number of shrines. It brings us to a uh, particularity of not just simply looking at big monuments, but also looking at uh, uh, also looking at small fragmentary pieces of information, their histories and the way in which they play uh, they played out. So, okay. In conclusion, I would simply uh, try to say the following: that in my multiple Deccan histories, I want to move away from the narrative of great dynasties and great monuments to looking at smaller units of historical understanding. Maybe perhaps we don't have, uh, we, have we don't have very, uh, uh, very fantastic uh, um, uh, source material, but I think we need to weave together fragments of information and the role of the fragment in integrating a meta-narrative uh, is, uh, is, is something that we have to think about. Secondly, an overemphasis of using literary perceptions are not endemic to the region that we are studying, well, we can use it, uh, actually, uh, we can use it to give a perspective of the region but that shouldn't be the identity of the region, a, a region of negative uh, impressions. Uh, and finally, I think that theoretical frameworks that we evolve to write about uh, these uh, meta histories of the nation state, uh, somehow or the other are not able to handle difference. And because they are not able to handle difference, those regions which, and I think the Deccan is full of multiplicity in religious faiths, multiplicities of economic modes of production, 
the, you know, Santana did that fantastic study on the Dangars of Maharashtra. You have the Chenchus over here. You have multiple, multiple forms of, of livelihoods and so on and so forth. And these things, you know, they don't easily fit in to a kind of nation state history. If it's like, a history of a neat, neatly bounded area that may fit into the meta of a nation's history, but these don't, and therefore they're just simply left out. Actually, I was so impressed uh, when I came here to Hyderabad that Arutra was writing a history of Telugu literature at that time, the famous uh, Telugu scholar. And, you know, he told me, he said, you know, ma'am, I, I, I have to take a look at all those coins you were mentioning, because I need to go back to those coins to see the origin of words so therefore, my history of Telugu literature would go back to those simple words and those simple things that are found in those points, uh, not uh, maybe uh, to a, a literary narrative thing. Now, I'll end by saying the following. Contemporary concerns make us look at history in a certain way from the modern perspective of fitting regions into a meta-narrative of a nation state's history. This unconsciously looks at ruptures in the way regions evolve rather than elements of continuity. Multiple, uh, being multiple histories, the Deccan provides interesting avenues for us to look at how both rupture and continue, uh, continuity allowed historical change. We have tried, I have tried to integrate topography, material culture, monuments, coins, artifacts, and beyond merely the written word to write history. Makes this a complex exercise, but, uh, but then anything dynamic and anything living is complex. I end on that note, and uh, Megha and Ranita will tell me whether there's time if I can show pictures. But I could show the pictures while questions are being asked also. Thank, uh, you. thank you so much for that, Professor. Uh, I'd say, see, we have one question so far. So I'd say you could show us uh, the images, and that might spark off more questions. Also. Okay, okay, yeah. good. So, okay. So this is the first uh, is the first set of uh, uh, material that I'm sharing with you, and these are uh, this is the excavations that were done in eighty one eighty two at those famous sites Kotalingala, Gulikata, and Pedabanguru. and there are different types of monuments there. There's a granary on on my right. Uh, uh, there's a fort fortified kind of settlement on at Kotalingala, and then there are uh, innumerable uh, Gopa King coins, which I was talking to you about. Uh, apart from structures, there is this fascinating material of uh, 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 iron furrows. This uh, my favorite. This uh, iron uh, scissors of the second century AD from Pedavankuru. This wonderful smiling face from Kotalingala, a mask from Dhulikatta next to it. Uh, and these, um, Arya Sharma was very fascinated by these uh, horses on seals. And this is the one, uh, is one from Pedabankuru. The, the role of horses in particular, because the megalithic society, there were three things, the horse, iron, and, uh, and of course, black and red were pottery. And there's another seal right in the middle, which is from Dhulikatta. All these uh, fascinating um, materials have all been found at early historic levels. Uh, the coin, again, some coins, and then uh, co uh, coin, um, what are they called? Um, uh, where you make coins, I'm forgetting the name. And then on the left, you have an ivory comb. So look at the elements, uh, look, at the, uh, look at these things of everyday use. Uh, I mean, you know, what, what I have been trying to emphasize is, not necessarily must we look at a great Buddhist stupa. Though, by the way, at Pashi Gaon near Kotalingala and also at, at Kotalingala, at Dhulikata, some two kilometers away, they have found Buddhist, uh, the bases, the base of Buddhist monuments. And of course, Fanigiri is a fantastic example, which is not very far away. Uh, but it's not that there weren't these monuments, but I think that this is the history that we have forgotten. Then in the lower Krishna Valley, of course, the, the legendary uh, the Bhatti Prolu inscription, which has the inscribed names of Banitas and Vanyas and all. And then there are the relic caskets uh, that were found there. And then the Sada coins. Uh, and at Amravati, of course, you know, everybody knows 
I mean, Amravati was butchered, no? Was they, some went to the Madras Museum, some went to the British Museum, etc. And this is like a very old stupa uh, in situ. Uh, Guntepali Congregation Hall and uh, the base, only the base of the stupa. You see, as I showed you, in coastal Andhra, there is every village has Buddhist remains. I mean, you know, they all need, just they need to be documented and systematically put into a database. So, and of course, this, I love these faces. And all the places which I studied, this is the terracotta face from Badamanu. Uh, and then here's Kondapur. You have, um, you know, glazed red pottery and this fantastic Koalan image. I can't find out what her ethnicity would be. I mean, all jewel, jewelry decked up. The Roman coins, the Roman coins were used as jewelry as well, like amulets. Uh, and uh, these wonderful smiling faces of terracotta uh, of women. Uh, again, these are, uh, they are found in large numbers and these beads, I just given a sampling of some of the beads, but uh, in the next slide you will see how Yazdani found, uh, he found them in hordes. You take a look at these uh, images of the 1942 excavation, in large, large numbers uh, 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 beads were found. These were the underground chambers he excavated. What were these underground chambers? Were merchants putting all their ware in these underground chambers? Uh, then there are these furnaces to make iron tools, uh, crucibles of iron over here. And then these are the more recent excavations with the, uh, which uh, Maheshwari did. And this is where she says that she's found a uh, circular structure rather than uh, tetya, uh, tetya shaped structure. And at the base, at the entry of this, she found a uh, inverted lachagori. This is not the lachagori which I put here, but another one, uh, a, a more complete one. Uh, and of course, then uh, at the corners of this circular thing, she found these, uh, they're not visible in this picture, but there are these very deep holes with ash and so on and so forth, which she says were Vedic altars. So here we are, but you know, at Kondapur, we have not found any Buddhist sculptures and we also haven't found any symbols that would indicate that this was, uh, you know, a major Buddhist uh, pilgrimage center. Uh, and this is Panigiri, uh, and I'm, uh, the first row is Panigiri, Viharas and, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, small stupas, of course, there are other better pictures. And then these, I wanted to just show you how the rock cut surfaces were used for water management, both in the north in Panigiri as well as in Totlakonda. Uh, even uh, steps were cut into the rock to, for people to access and move down to, uh, to uh, have the water. And what Lars Pogan did at Totlakonda was that he walked each and every inch, inch down from the Vihara down to the village settlements and all, whatever he found on the way he documented. It's like a fantastic study of these early uh, monastic establishments in uh, Andhra Pradesh. And this is Patan Cheru, the excavations done by the director of the Krisat, that they found uh, a sun temple apparently, but what they are clearing out is this fantastic viragal. Those of you who are from Telangana know that this is quite a common thing. These warriors, you know, these very simple warriors with these weapons that are found, and their images are found everywhere. And they're probably these local headmen or local uh, warrior chiefs that are found everywhere. Alongside in Patanjali, you also find lots of Nagas and Nagini images. At the same time, uh, by the time you reach the Kakatiyan times, you also find very classical images of uh, Dwarapa, Lady Dwarapalas. Uh, and in some senses, there is a kind of a remnants of the Buddhist uh, contact over here, but this, they have like painted it, the local villages. You know, there's a village part of Patancheru and there's an Ikrisat part. I'll show you the Ikrisat part where you have all these wonderful cleaned images all put in one of them, Kube, the god Kube, because being a market, being a Jain town and being a market town, Kube, of course, had to be worshipped. A wonderful image of Kube, which unfortunately was in the dining hall, the kitchen and dining hall area. They decorated it with Kube. Uh, and then uh, we, you know, we, we looked at all these other images, all on a crescent, very clean, very sanitized, but totally out of context. So one doesn't really know where they came from, but must have come from when they started building Ikrisat over there. Uh, and then this is Amravati and Nagarjun Konda. And accessing the other, I'd just like you to take a look at the uh, 
uh, you know, tunic dresses and Turidar kind of pandamas or guards and Nagarjun Konda a wine cup and these long mongoloid features and beards. Uh, very different, uh, well, can we use the word foreign looking people or whatever, and you have the wonderful chenchus. Uh, there are, it's just one, but there are about 10 to 12 such wonderful images of the local, uh, probably chenchus, we don't know, but they are exhibiting a very lively, worldly kind of life, very far removed from a renunciation oriented religion that was probably being preached at these sites. Uh, and then uh, uh, this uh, this uh, uh, overflowing Purnaghata uh, has an inscription, which is uh, lo and behold donated by a charmakara, a leather worker uh, and his family and friends. Uh, though his father is a teacher uh, in the Buddhist Sangha, he and his family and friends coming from the charmakara donate this to the Buddhist Sangha. So here this accessing the other part, I'm, I'm discussing all these features. Uh, and at Shravana Belgola, some of you are familiar, you may have visited, uh, the entire rock surfaces have got these reliefs. And all these people are undergoing the famous renunciation oriented, um, you know, salenkana, that is mortification of the body. Uh, and there are inscriptions and there are nuns and others attending to those that are under, not only at Shravana Belgola, there's another place called Kopugal and many places where there were, which became Jain Tithas of the early medieval times. And uh, here is Nanakram Guna, where I, these are some of the people that I talked to and uh, their histories. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing about Nanakram Guna was that, uh, you know, uh, with the, uh, I mean, I did this after the formation of the Telangana state, and therefore uh, the uh, Maisamma shrines, the Takukama, and all these local festivals and all suddenly came of age. And this is something very significant. They were all lying, suppressed or they were they were not like really being discussed uh, and then of course uh, just a small picture of the ancient well and the ancient temple over there also at Nanakram Gura. So this was the last of the studies I did so uh, some scholarly um, some historians would like really question why a kind of a contemporary study should be put within the category of early uh, Deccan but I wanted to make a point about continuity of settlements and that village settlements do not change so dramatically using the annals school formula. I mean, if, if, if landscapes are not changing till recently, uh, the rocky landscapes, the water, the water uh, zones, so to speak, the way the lakes were connected to each other didn't change. It's only now that we are on the cusp of, uh, well, we already have seen, uh, or we have been on a cusp of uh, disaster uh, in terms of the flooding of Hyderabad. But I think communities had been very protective of their environment and many of the sacred shrines which we studied over here were lying uh, in niches, in rocky niches. And so nobody destroyed them because they were, they were there. And it's only the Gulf Coast that came along and banned these people from entering into that area uh, and so on and so forth. So this is what I wanted to share in terms of the photographs. Uh, and that's it. Uh, that's all I have to say. And should we go to the chat box, Ronita? Yes. Thank you so much for that, Professor. We have uh, two brief questions. Uh, no, we have three questions on chat and one on YouTube. So I'm just going to read them out to you. So the first is from Juhi Ahmed. Uh, the question is, please share a bit more about... An Nanaka Ramguda, what are the leftover bits of the settlements there? Never knew about the temple, which one and where? Uh, okay, so there's a Ranganath Swami temple uh, and the ancient part of that temple is in ruins, but it's still very much there, not protected by anybody because this is a private property of the Pitti family. But there is the, the, the niche, the, uh, the, the uh, Vishnu, uh, Sheshashai Vishnu shrine over there, which is being worshipped currently. It's also got an intact plaque. Uh, the settlement has been encroached quite a lot. As I just mentioned, uh, the golf course has come up. The sacred space of Nanakram Goda is now under litigation because the MR properties have uh, captured all these uh, Sita Mata shrines and the uh, Ayappa shrines and so on and see. You know, all these village settlements didn't have 
big temples, except for this Ranganath Swami temple, everything else are small Pochamma shrines or Maisamma shrines and all. So all these are getting impacted because the Patukama festival also is very difficult to celebrate because the wildflowers near the lakes and near the lake bodies, the buffaloes have been sold and now they have made houses for the so-called software engineers and their wives and their thing to come and live there. So there is a major dramatic change in the ecology as well as in the settlement pattern at Nanakram Guda. It was lucky that we were able to document whatever little we documented over there. And their main, their main Cheburu, their main, uh, this, uh, it's called Vipro Lake now. It is Medubai Kunta, it's become Vipro Lake. And there's a Patel Kunta, and then there's another lake. Now it is on, on the, in the ISB campus. So imagine the settlement was spread from the ISB campus right up till what is called the outer ring road. It was actually a Zamindari, Maniconda Zamindari. You know? I, uh, the, the revenue rents and so on. So but we were told that the 75 peso or something like that, they had to pay revenue rents. And the access into Nanakram Buddha from Golidhoti. Golidhoti was, of course, just a, a pastoral uh, encampment site. Right? Uh, uh, there was no entry. I mean, there were rocks. They had to, you know, travel through pagdandis uh, and pathways to come, and they used to bring wood into Nanakram Gura. But the fascinating thing is that we are talking about particularity, but we are also talking about contact with populations as far away as, as Uttar Pradesh, because these uh, Lodhas came under uh, as guards uh, under the Nizam period, and they continued to remain guards. And uh, in, in Hyderabad, there are many settlements of these Lodas in Hyderabad. So, I mean, you know, the, the, the history of uh, uh, communication. Uh, I forgot to mention there is a very famous archaeologist called B. Subarao who has written about areas of nuclear, extra, uh, nuclear attraction, areas of isolation, and areas of relative isolation. And he puts the Deccan into areas of relative isolation because these are areas of communication. So people have always been moving and traveling in these areas. And as a result, you had uh, a lot of different kind of populations, not just in the medieval period. It, well before the medieval period, there have been many migratory patterns into this region. And so a small settlement like Nanakram Gura yields 50% of the population of these people. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah no, thank okay. you, Professor. Yeah. Then uh, Luna Banerjee asks if this is a type of micro history. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, the micro, uh, so, so the whole of it is not a micro history, only this little last bit, perhaps we could put into the category of a micro history because this is like a, a, a the smallest of the units that I looked at, but primarily it is what we call settlement archaeology, archaeology of settlements, there's, a, there's an entire thing called settlement archaeology. So within that, actually, the broad term that is used is landscape archaeology, because as I said, the written word uh, uh, I mean, as far as textual material is not there, so mapping out settlements and looking at their nature. So uh, I'm not just simply saying individual settlement will tell you about the whole region. You have to look at a cluster of settlements. And if you have to look at a cluster of settlements, then you have to divide a broader region into a subregion, and then within the subregion into a zone, which I call the mid uh, which I call a locality, actually. I don't call it a zone, I call it a locality. And then within the localities, maybe you have individual settlements, uh, individual sites, individual, uh, which is, is something that I'm not really discussed in the presentation, but I do discuss that uh, in the book. I should also show everybody the book. It's going, to, if I can just publicize it, uh, the global edition is going to be brought out by Rutledge UK. So all of you who are not living in India have to buy the global edition. The South Asia edition is out and available on Amazon and Flipkart. Right. Thank you, Professor. So there are a lot of appreciative messages. Uh, aside from those, I see three more questions. One is from Suchandra Ghosh, uh, whose question reads, I am curious to know whether you have come across coastal settlements in the eastern seaboard apart from the major ones. I ask this as we have reference to five Mahanavikas and seven Mahasarthavahas in a ninth century copper plate of the Eastern Chalukya ruler Vishnuvardhana, the fifth. 
there could have been vibrant coastal societies but i really don't know yeah yeah uh, nice uh, yes you see for the uh, uh, inscriptions to refer to these even in the even the uh, telugu ins uh, kannada inscriptions and telugu inscriptions but for the early historic period uh, himanshu prabha ray has looked at the mammoth of information that is there many of these settlements uh, are now england right so but the coromandel coast was very difficult to nav navigate and so therefore actually on the coastline settlements uh, are, are very difficult to find but uh, uh, a little interior uh, uh, overlooking like totalagonda bavikonda and all these things are overlooking the ocean right uh, uh, but they are on the leeward side so actually on the thing uh, is difficult not only that nagarjun konda amravati at uh, also at uh, also at kontapalli there, there are all the navikas the architects the all these professional names are found in large but uh, in particular evidence of actual settlements to be identifiable as of now that is very difficult because there was a lot of change the the flow of the river krishna the the way in which the delta portion has changed the godavari in particular much more i mean it was not as well inhabited in early historical times as the krishna basin was so these are all issues we have to bear in mind all right uh moving to the next question uh rachna sinsanwar asks is there any connection with mathura in specific some of the lady sculptures look very much uh, like they are from mathura and it was a mahanagar palika hmm uh well the big uh, the big debates uh Um, that uh, you know sanchi mathura barut uh, you know the fact that people were uh, traveling uh, with the monks uh, influences may have come but i think that uh, it was the local artisans and local artists that made these uh, images and if you look at the ethnography if you look at the uh, faces and so on and so forth many of them look very local the 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 designs of the jewelry and so on and so forth but i am not able to sort of you know forcefully say that yes indeed people came from mathura in fact you know i would like to mention i should have mentioned that a fantastic study has been the or studies have been done on sanchi uh, in terms of almost 700 inscriptions and bit by bit a uh, systematic i think we need to do that for many other many sites in the deccan as well a systematic way in which the community and the monks interacted with each other so i think that yes there were influences of uh, buddhists traveling way i mean if we uh, you know if we can even say from gandhara down to uh, sri parvata because nagarjuna the famous uh, buddhist mahayana buddhist uh, teacher lived Uh, in andhra and uh, so there were so so uh, uh, in a, in another context i have discussed uh, there are uh, there are several um, schools of mahayana buddhist thinking uh, that uh, mushroomed uh, in this part of the country i mean that is uh, around uh, nagarjuna valley in fact many of them were theravada monastery that slowly slowly became mine there's a scholar called joseph walzer who has written about nagarjuna text and context and he Uh, uh, has tried to identify some of these monasteries uh, in the andhra areas also in telangana to argue that uh, much of what went as mahayana buddhism in the chinese context traveled from this part of the country so it's not that people were not traveling particularly the monks and uh, uh, when buddhism became such a powerful ideological force in this region there were people from here also were traveling to other parts of the country so there may be may have been influences but i do believe that there were local andhra shilpins and local artists terracotta makers and all who are making there's a lot of similarity you saw the people who were the images i showed you in the godavari delta and then in kondapur and so on and so there was some similarity in those terracotta may i ask you sure um, we have one pending question may okay. i just get through that get through with that question and then you could ask yours sure yeah. thank you sir um so we have we have one question from the youtube uh, live stream professor uh, uh the question is uh 
how do you see the impact of hippalus seasonal winds triggering roman trade and their impact on the regions beyond vindhyas yeah a lot uh, the discovery of the monsoons uh, and the peripolis of the erythrean sea in fact i i had noted it down somewhere that uh, the uh, the zest with which uh, all these uh, historical settlements were being excavated especially the buddhist monuments and the wall towns because the greeks had referred to the uh, greeks and romans had referred to the uh, the the fabled 40 walled towns of the andre uh, and so uh, the uh, discovery of the monsoons ad 54 and after especially uh, i showed you this map which himanshu prabhari has made of all the port towns on the way. these were all areas where trade with, with the romans or the representatives of the romans came not only to the malabar but also to the konkan coast and through those very narrow passes uh, got into the hinterland of the deccan so a lot Uh, a lot of impact uh, of the discovery of the monsoons and uh, the uh, uh, you know they uh, they have found hordes not one or two hordes of roman coins gold and silver roman coins in many parts of the deccan not only in coimbatore and kerala and tamil nadu but also in many parts of andhra and telangana and so on and so forth so and the, and the and the and the and these people were so fascinated with these coins that they uh, imitated these and made clay imitations of roman coins and used them as jewelry and also made holes many of the coins which are in the lockers of the state department of archaeology and on and you look saw them all of them had holes on the top they were using it like pallis so professor there's uh, one last question on youtube yeah. which is that uh, it is great to see your observations on local folks and or deities can you share your opinion on sanskritization of local folklore many adivasis of gond tribe have raised concerns on the same yeah so this is uh, the uh, this process of sanskritization brahmanization aryanization kshatriyaization all these ization's i think these are very simplistic models that uh, we have been you know blatantly using for the period that i am discussing we don't have issues because we are really not talking about large scale transformation of local shrines into brahmanical temples or or, or you know, whatever but what we do have is the integration of uh, yakshas yakshinis nagas nagadevatas etc into even even within the buddhist context this is something uh, that scholars have written a lot about kinaras uh half human half uh, uh, animal uh, naginis all this uh, was uh, possibly integrated into both jain and buddhist monuments but the period that i am discussing there's no large scale uh, uh, sanskritization so to speak it does begin to happen in the early medieval period and then uh the question i mean that's a totally different topic i mean i have different views on that that the way in which the local shrines are subsumed within the brahmanized thing happens in some key zones that become major uh, pilgrim centers but i think that they also continue to exist because my study of nanakram goda showed that the pochamma shrine or the maisamma shrine remained the maisamma shrine where the where that chicken is uh, sacrificed and uh, all these things are done uh, and the uh, full moon time the uh, people come and celebrate over there the change happened at this village when you have a whole lot of these scz companies coming and then suddenly one fine day we found that the maisamma has become madurga so this is happening in 2016 but till 2016 and even in 2014 12 when we were visiting this this is hyderabad this is a, a major urban center where sitting the backyard of the university there were these local shrines that were continue to remain local shrines and these nag and naginis even uh, and some of the people over here like juhi and others we all went to ikrisat and we found that the naga nagani sculptures very ancient sculptures are still being worshiped as naga naginis there is no no brahmanical temple or no other temple the fact these very powerful ideas of creativity and creative elements being integrated into the buddhist pantheon was also something that happened the argument over here therefore is that in the early dakkan society 
uh, on the one hand, uh, the particularity of these local trends has remained. On the other hand, when Buddhism, Jainism came, they integrated some of it. And in, in many cases, the Buddhist stupa is over a, uh, is over a megalithic burial site because the relics, mm -hmm. uh, the, the stupa is also a worship of relics. Uh, megalithic people were also for, uh, uh, worshiping the sacred relics and so on and so forth. Okay, so so I think that we have to. Your question is very valid, but I think that these that's exactly what my point was. That I'm like really, uh, you know, disturbed by these uh, generalizations. That there is a pan-Indian generalizations and these isations of where Sanskrit language, uh, Kshatriyas as a thing. I mean, you know, there are so many local chiefs. No, they have their own. There are no. There are no points anywhere else in India with local, with these names, these, these uh, legends that you have on these local coins. We don't find any other part of the country having these names. The Mahatalvaras, the Gopas, the Hastins, the Sadas, right? The rest of India, these legendary coins comes much later. Even the great imperial, so-called imperial Mauryas had only punch mark coins. So I think this is exactly my point. The particularity of regions, the way they do regional history, how we need to question some theorizations that happen like in this general break, as though every uh, settlement became Brahmanized or Sanskritized and so on and so forth. Where did it happen? Why did it happen? What form did it take? I have, I have some material on that. You can contact me and I can discuss that with you later. Thank you so much for that, Professor. Uh, we are almost out of time. Yeah. So we have two questions, one from the speaker who spoke a little while ago and one in the chat, which uh, can we forward those to you for you to respond to them? Yeah, sure. I will yeah. do that. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for that. I mean, I did my entire schooling in Karnataka. I had never heard of half the things you mentioned. <laughs> so and, and clearly even people who are professionally like following histories uh, at an academic level also uh, don't have as clear an idea of this as they do of uh, other regions of the country. So thank you for animating these uh, slices of history uh, so, uh, so uh, wonderfully, question, Professor. Thank you. The, que yeah. the question from the audience? Where was yes, the I had, but she says there's no time. Uh, you You're can ask a quick question. Yeah, quick question. Okay. Uh, this is more for, you know, students engaged yeah. in, with uh, histori history. Yeah. Uh, all the research that's so fascinating uh, that you discussed today, and very true, everything is generalized, you know, when it sh which should, should be region focused. Uh, will your work and findings find a place in school history books or college history books? Because uh, students need to be aware of current updates of findings yes. instead of, you know, all the old books and authors that we are still continuing with. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, you are a very pertinent question. And uh, one is involved with informing scholars who are writing school textbooks and act, particularly college textbooks. Uh, sudden, I mean, I'm located in Hyderabad. So the government of Telangana is like uh, very, very serious about relooking at whatever okay. is the history of Telangana. Uh, similarly, uh, the history of Andhra Pradesh and other. See, the thing is that uh, to get all this research in, in a systematic form, uh, we really need to have teamwork. Correct. Okay. So this can't be done by one individual. I think we have to identify, I mean, I'm reminded of the Eklavya project, you know, looking at the tribal histories of uh, different parts of the country, uh, I mean, particularly in Madhya Pradesh, writing in the local language, getting it access to school children of smaller areas and so on. I did for the Nanagram Buddha and all that, I did a documentary thing and I went and showed it and I went and showed it in, uh, in schools and in uh, these areas. And uh, I think that it sort of resonated with uh, school children. Uh, a lot. So I think we need to do teamwork and we have to organize this, but there have been a lot of queries, especially in the re because the rewriting of the history project is always happens, you know, as you know. After the breakdown of the uh, Soviet Union, people were writing histories of Turmek, Turkmenistan and Tajikistan and all, and they wanted to erase all their Persian and Russian histories, and they wanted to write their Turk history. So similarly, uh, here also now, I mean, there is this concern, and I think that I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not trying to rom romanticize the local. What I'm trying to say is let's integrate, let's look from below above and integrate the local into a a kind of a, narr a narrative so that we have a more holistic view 
of what the cult country's culture and uh, traditions were. Because there is, a meaning, there is a meaning of these yes. traditions for the people that are, are, are still living in different Absolutely. different levels of social and economic development. You know, they're not like all of, all of them are not like you and me. No, it's all uh, seems to be in the past, every time in the past. I know, no, there's, for, in these the people, for these people, the past is not some alien land like how you and me look at the past, <laughs> distant past. For them, it's very much their present. I learned a lot about how, what we should understand as history. Actually, French scholars like Michel de Sertor and others have been discussing this uh, seriously to why, how and why we really need to talk about, uh, you know, memory as a very important element uh, uh, rather than just the archival, uh, just archival yes. word. The archival word is very delimiting. And we remain ignorant for life. Yeah, okay. That's Anita exactly. is uh, the timekeeper and she's getting very <laughs> annoyed. <laughs> Sorry, no, no, I'm not getting annoyed. Not Thank at all. You. It's just, I mean, you have also been talking for a long time. It would be nice. If no, it's also... okay. All right. oh, it's okay. We so, don't get uh, much opportunity to talk a right. lot these days. All right. In that case, I'm just including the last question as well, since it makes no sense for just one question to be sent to you in writing. Huh? So uh, the question is, it is being suggested that that Harappan script was Gond culture based. Are there any views on the ancestral connection and base in Harappan civilization? So, so sorry that I won't be able to answer this question, but I do know that our uh, the, the indigenous language uh, group in our university has been transcribing some of the tribal languages and maybe I can find out a bit about this, but I do, think, I mean, you know, in a cursory way, I do think it's too far-fetched to think of the Harappan. I mean, people have tried a lot about the Harappan script and it being a proto dravidian And so, I mean, this is some a question I cannot answer, but I can ask the group that is looking at these uh, languages, the indigenous languages, uh, because uh, mother tongue studies and so on and so forth, people are doing. And, 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 and one thing I can say that there has been in recent years, I, I don't know whether Banga is still here, but uh, they, people have been doing a lot of studies on the Gonds and the Lambaras and others. And they have been trying to access the oral histories of these uh, communities. So uh, in uh, modern times and in, in colonial times, we can go back to, to the Bheels. In fact, now I have to participate uh, with Ajay Sakarya's talk on, uh, you know, he's worked a lot on uh, on this issue. Uh, you know, there there is an interest, there's a serious interest, and maybe this question is emanating out of that. Uh, and also the previous question about the concern of this uh, uh, subsuming of all the shrines under uh, a Brahmanical, um, you know, monolithization of, uh, of culture. So, um, I won't be able to answer that question, sadly. I have to end by saying, no, I can't answer. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, Professor. I'm sure even if you weren't able to answer that directly, it, that, that was more helpful, I suppose, than you could have been. You've offered to do some further Anyways, looking up. So I, want thank to you. Thank, I want to thank all these lovely people who have joined, and some of them are like I haven't met for a long time. But thank you all so much. And, uh, you know, please do send your critical comments if you lay your hands on the book. Uh, I mean, you know, this was a sequel to the earlier uh, book on the Deccan. Maybe there should be another taking. I mean, I haven't done much on Karnataka. My Karnataka, Kanediga friends were saying that, you know, why didn't you write more about Karnataka? I mean, it's just, I just don't have the material so easily available. So will you all please uh, send critical comments then? suggestions. Maybe we can all carry this forward. Thank so, you so uh, much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Megha. Thank you so much. When we were, you know, you so much, we were discussing doing this, I knew that it was going to be fascinating. Mm -hmm. But this has been fascinating beyond expectations. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Not History for Peace is always a fantastic forum to be on and uh, I will continue to join your wonderful sessions as and when they happen. Thank you so much. Right, Thank we'll you. be in touch, yeah. Okay, that, bye everybody, bye. On bye, that Michelle. note, uh, Professor, Yeah. hello. Yes, yeah. on that note, we have a couple of announcements to make about upcoming events. Okay. So you can get the update now as well. Uh -huh. So on the 9th of December, 
we have continuing our collaboration with Karva. We have a social science teacher's special session with the historian Shekhar Bandhupattai on decolonization. So uh, we, if you check out our Facebook page, the video link to Karva's uh, talk with the professor is already present. So mm. we are inviting questions from social science teachers across the country mm. based on that talk for Professor Bandhubadhyay. And uh, so the deadline for that is the 3rd of December. So we invite your questions. Uh, the second quick announcement, which you will see more about on our Facebook pages and our other social media pages, is that we have an exciting conversation coming up next Saturday uh, on the history of dissent to be, uh, and the people conversing are going to be uh, the historians Romila Thapar, uh, Kunal Chakraborty, and Professors Apurvanand, and one second. So, so Shikhar. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I was confused about the last name. Yes. And uh, Suhas Palshikar. So that will be next Saturday. And the deadline for the Shikhar Bandhupadhyay questions is the 3rd of December. So we're looking forward to both the questions and to seeing all of you uh, on Saturday. Okay. Thank you so much again. Yeah. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.